Welcome to the Reformanda Initiative podcast, where we analyze and discuss Roman Catholic theology and practice from an evangelical perspective. My name is Reed Carr, and I am the Associate Director of the Reformanda Initiative. And it's just me today, but uh, don't worry. Uh, we have what we hope is an informative and interesting episode for you uh, that examines one of the more important and controversial aspects of Catholic doctrine, that being the doctrine of transubstantiation. So hopefully it will be interesting. But before we dive in to that, let me encourage you, our listeners, who might be considering theological training, uh, to check out our good friends and partners at Union School of Theology. Uh, Union is an excellent institution with an excellent staff. In fact, I'm a student there myself and have very much enjoyed uh, my experience. Without a doubt, the church needs more leaders and laymen and women that are theologically trained. So please go check out Union at ust.ac.uk to see what they might have for you. That's uh, ust.ac.uk. Also, as Clay mentioned in our last episode, uh, the Reformand Initiative is now a recognized nonprofit in the U.S. So if you would like to make a tax-deductible donation to our work and efforts and support us, please feel free to do so uh, through our website at reformandainitiative.org or send us an email at info at reformandainitiative.org and we will let you know how to make that happen. Uh, of course, we would be extremely grateful. Okay, so let's dive into the topic at hand today, the famous doctrine of transubstantiation. Now, we're not going to get into the philosophy of the doctrine and its development today, but we do need to provide a very brief explanation of what transubstantiation is and means for our listeners who might not be familiar with the term. I would imagine most people recognize the term, but maybe you've forgotten exactly what it means. So if that's the case, no problem. <clears throat> Quite simply, transubstantiation is the teaching that the elements of the Eucharist, namely the bread and wine, are converted into the actual body and blood of Christ. And all that remains is the mere appearance of the bread and wine. <clears throat> this change is brought about by the Eucharistic prayer in which God is invoked to send the Holy Spirit to bring about, about this change. Now, the bulk of our discussion today will involve a critique of a book that speaks on this very topic, and it's written by a Catholic professor and theologian by the name of Brant Petre. And I'm not sure that's exactly how you pronounce his last name. Uh, it's P-I-T-R-E. Uh, and I looked up online and it suggested Petre as a pronunciation, so I hope I'm not mistaken. Apologies <clears throat> if so. But the, doc, the book that Dr. Petre wrote that we'll be discussing is titled Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, Unlocking the Secrets of the Last Supper. And in the introduction to his book, Dr. Petre says this about the Eucharist, quote, according to the Catholic faith, when a Catholic priest takes the bread and wine of the Eucharist and says the words of Jesus from the Last Supper, this is my body, this is my blood, the bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Christ. Although the appearances of bread and wine remain, the taste, the touch, etc., the reality is that there is no more bread and wine. There's only Jesus, his body, his blood, his soul, and his divinity. This is called the doctrine of Jesus' real presence in the Eucharist, end quote. Now, certainly the Catechism of the Catholic Church affirms this. In fact, in section 1375 of the Catechism, we read this, quote, It is by the conversion of the bread and wine into Christ's body and blood that Christ becomes present in this sacrament, end quote. Then in the preceding section, section 1374, we read this, quote, The mode of Christ's presence under the Eucharistic species is unique. It raises the Eucharist above all the sacraments as the perfection of the spiritual life and the end to which all sacraments tend. In the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood, together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore the whole, the whole Christ is truly 
really and substantially contained, end quote. So those are the official teachings of the Catholic Church on transubstantiation. Clearly, there is some philosophy and metaphysics involved with this teaching and doctrine, but that is not what we are interested in at the moment. We are interested specifically in the teaching that the elements of the Eucharist, namely the bread and wine, are converted or changed into the actual body and blood of Christ. And all that remains is the mere appearance of the bread and wine. So that when the Catholic faithful partake in the Eucharist, they are partaking in the actual body and blood and soul and divinity of Christ and are therefore experiencing Christ personally and intimately through the consumption of the transformed elements. Now, this doctrine, not surprisingly, has been a topic of debate uh, for centuries. And the debate concerning this uh, doctrine uh, throughout the centuries is also not where we are going to focus our attention uh, right now, as that would require several episodes to cover, or one extremely long episode, and I know no one wants to listen to me talk for that long. But suffice this to say that Protestants and evangelicals do not hold to the doctrine of transubstantiation or the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. We do not believe that Christ is actually present physically during the celebration of the Lord's Supper. He is certainly present spiritually, but not physically, and we will get to why we reject his physical presence uh, shortly. And I believe we've addressed this a bit in a past episode, but we'll explain it once again here, as it's certainly important for the church and has significant theological and practical implications. But let's, uh, let's get back to the book uh, mentioned earlier, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, Unlocking the Secrets of the Last Supper. Now, the subtitle makes it sound a little bit like a Dan Brown book, like there's still some unknown mystery to be solved about the Lord's Supper and some secret hidden chamber buried deep beneath Vatican City where we might find such a mystery. Reading the book, however, I didn't get the sense that some major mystery was being solved and unlocked. I don't know, maybe it's wishful thinking on part of the author, as he himself notes towards the end of the book in chapter 7 on page 72, quote, pretty much everything I've said, at least everything worthwhile, has more or less been said before. Most of the ideas in this book are not new. In fact, they're quite old. And not only are they old, but they're fairly accessible, end quote. So it's still to be still to be determined the uh, mysteries that are being unlocked in this book. A little bit about the author. Again, his name is Brant Petre, and he is, according to his own website at brantpetre.com, B-R-A-N-T-P-I-T-R-E.com, uh, the Distinguished Research Professor of Scripture at the Augustan Institute. And he earned his PhD in theology from the University of Notre Dame, where he specialized in the study of the New Testament and ancient Judaism. And he has several books, uh, one of which concerns the, uh, the Jewish roots of Mary, in fact. It is more recent than the book we are looking at today, however, which was published in 2011. And I became aware of and interested in this book when a friend of mine, who is an American but has lived in Spain for 11 years, where he and his family uh, minister alongside an evangelical church, uh, told me about it. And he learned about it from an American family that they worked alongside in Spain. Uh, and there were also evangelicals working with the evangelical church, but then converted to Roman Catholicism and have since moved back to the U.S., and they cited this book uh, by Dr. Petre as instrumental in their decision to convert to Roman Catholicism. So hearing that, I was anxious to get my hands on a copy and see uh, what was so convincing for them in this book. And I was quite interested to learn that a book that was instrumental in the conversion of an evangelical uh, family to Catholicism was focused solely on the Eucharist, and in particular, Jesus's actual physical presence uh, in the Eucharist. <clears throat> now, I'm going to say from the outset that after reading the book, uh, I'm really miffed about how this book could be instrumental in leading an evangelical to convert to Roman Catholicism. Uh, quite honestly, I found uh, Petre's arguments to be weak and unconvincing, and we'll examine that more in just a bit. But suffice it to say, I'm surprised that this book 
would convince someone to convert to Roman Catholicism, but it's definitely worth taking a look at uh, for that reason. <clears throat> but this, this discussion is important for another reason as well. Uh, one of our listeners, uh, who is Canadian, but studies at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, says that in many of his uh, lively and friendly conversations with his Catholic friends, he asks them what would have to change in Roman Catholicism in order for them to leave the Catholic Church. And he said that many of the doctrines you would expect uh, to be the answer are not a concern to them at all. Instead, what is regularly given as an answer concerns the church's teaching of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. That is what is most important to them. Now, why would that be? And why do we have an evangelical family converting to Roman Catholicism, citing Dr. Petre's book on the physical presence of Christ in the Eucharist as being instrumental in their conversion? And why are many Catholics telling our evangelical listener that the one thing that would have to change in Roman Catholic teaching in order for them to leave is the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist? Uh, so those are some interesting questions to consider and certainly worthwhile for us to explore. And so that's what we want to do with the rest of our time, and we will do so using Dr. Petre's book as a guide for our discussion. So, so let's dive into that, to that book. Uh, not surprisingly, the main scripture in the New Testament on which Dr. Petre builds his case for the teaching on transubstanti transubstantiation is the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 53 to 58. And I'll uh, read it now. And I'm reading from the ESV version of the Bible. Um, <clears throat> begins this way. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man <clears throat> and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. End quote. So those words, according to the Catholic faith, and certainly according to Dr. Petre, are to be taken literally. Uh, Dr. Petre does, however, acknowledge that not everyone interprets John 6 to be literal in its meaning and application. In fact, on page 8, he says, quote, To say the least, not everyone sees John chapter 6 as conclusive evidence for the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. For one thing, many interpret Jesus' words symbolically or spiritually, arguing that Jesus did not intend for his disciples to take him literally. The flesh is of no avail. It is the spirit that gives life. Jesus says in the same chapter, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, quoting John 6, 63, and that's the end quote. Now, while the words of Jesus here may not be conclusive evidence of transubstantiation, what Dr. Petre goes on to argue throughout his book is that if Jesus' words are understood in their historical Jewish context, then we understand that a literal interpretation of Jesus' words is the correct and necessary interpretation. In fact, on page eight, he makes this claim, saying, quote, if you really want to know who Jesus was and what he was saying and doing, then you need to interpret his words and deeds in their historical context. And that means becoming familiar with not just ancient Christianity, but also with ancient Judaism, end quote. Then on page 10, he concludes the introduction of his book saying this, quote, as we will see, it is precisely the Jewish roots of Jesus's words that will enable us to unlock the secrets of who he was and what he meant when he said to his disciples, take, eat, this is my body, end quote. Then on page 17, uh, the author is clear with what his goal is in writing this book. He says, quote, my goal is to explain how a first century Jew like Jesus, Paul, or any of the apostles, could go from believing that drinking my blood, much less human blood, was an abomination before God, to believing that drinking the blood of Jesus was actually necessary for Christians. Unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Here he's quoting John 6, 53, end quote. <clears throat> 
So in order to achieve his goal, the author draws parallels between the New Testament and the Old Testament, which reflects uh, ancient Jewish custom and history. Now, grounding our understanding of the New Testament and Jesus's words in the Old Testament is certainly good and correct. Otherwise, it would be impossible to understand and comprehend the significance of what Christ accomplished on the cross. However, the error Dr. Petrie makes is in his application and interpretation of the parallels he makes, which is what we are about to discuss and examine. In chapter two, the author rightly draws a parallel between Moses and the exodus of the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt with the new and greater Moses we see emerge in the New Testament and the person of the Messiah who frees his people from the bondage of slavery to sin. Dr. Petre pays particular attention to Exodus chapter 24, when God confirms his covenant with his people after delivering them from bondage in Egypt. It is a covenant, Petre points out, that was sealed in blood. Like Exodus 24, 8 says, quote, And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Uh, end quote. On page 30, the author then notes uh, that the making of covenant does not end with the death of the sacrificial animal, but with a banquet, a heavenly meal. And here he quotes Exodus 24, 11, which reads, quote, And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank, end quote. Then uh, Dr. Petra concludes chapter 2 with these words. Quote, Jesus is not just a new Moses. He's also the new Israel, the chosen son of God, who will undergo the new exodus in his own person. By means of his passion and death, Jesus himself will lead the people of God to the new promised land of the new creation. Of course, if these connections are correct, they raise more questions than answers. The first is this. If Jesus expected there to be a new exodus, how exactly did he think it would happen? End quote. On the next page, which is the beginning of chapter three, he answers his own question, saying, quote, as any ancient Jew would have known, if there's going to be a new exodus, then it would seem that there would need to be a new Passover as well, end quote. So the answer lies in the new Passover, and here is where the book begins to derail quite a bit, and the arguments laid out by the author fail to convince. <clears throat> In fact, on page 49, uh, Dr. Petre is setting the table for the main point he wants to make in his book, that being the necessity of interpreting Jesus' words in John chapter 6, literally. He writes, quote, At his final Passover, on the night of the, of the Last Supper, Jesus did something strange. During that meal, instead of speaking about the past exodus from Egypt, Jesus talked about his future suffering and death. On that night, instead of explaining the meaning of the flesh of the Passover lamb, Jesus identified the bread and wine of the supper as his own body and blood and commanded the disciples to eat and drink. Why? The answer, I suggest, can be found in the Jewish hope for a new exodus. Although the last supper was a Passover meal, it was not ordinary. <clears throat> On that night, Jesus was not just celebrating one more memorial of the exodus from Egypt. <clears throat> Rather, he was establishing a new Passover, the long-awaited Passover of the Messiah. <clears throat> By means of this sacrifice, Jesus would inaugurate the new exodus, which the prophets had foretold and for which the Jewish people had been waiting. It is this connection between the Last Supper and the new Passover that will provide us with our first clue to answering the riddle of how Jesus could have commanded the disciples to eat his body and drink his blood, end quote. <clears throat> In order to solve this so-called riddle of how Jesus could have commanded his disciples to eat his flesh and drink his blood, and to convince his reader that Jesus' words should be taken literally, Dr. Petre reminds us of the instructions God gave his people uh, during the original Passover in Exodus chapter 12, in which the firstborn male of every Egyptian household would be struck down by God. But the firstborn of God's people uh, would, of course, be spared by blind, applying the blood of a lamb to the doorways of their homes. He then lays out the steps God gave his people uh, to be spared during the Passover. And the first step of God's instructions was to choose an unblemished male lamb. Step two was to sacrifice the lamb. Step three was the spreading of the blood of the lamb in the doorways of the homes. Then step four, which according to the author on page 55, is the most forgotten step 
but arguably the most important for understanding Jesus's actions at the Last Supper is the eating of the flesh of the lamb. Here and here, I'm quoting him from page 55. Any ancient Jew would have known, the author says, that the Passover sacrifice was not completed by the death of the lamb, but by eating his flesh, end quote. Then lastly, step five is keeping the Passover as a day of remembrance. In fact, Exodus 12, 14 says, this, is the, this day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast, end quote. So here is where Dr. Petre makes his major error and the entire argument of his book completely derails and loses credibility. In fact, citing Exodus 12, 14, the author states on page 58, quote, here we see that the final step was for the Passover liturgy to be repeated. Every year in the spring, on the 14th day of the, day of the month of Nisan, Israel was to celebrate this day of remembrance in honor of the salvation that had been won for them by God through the hands of Moses. This command to renew the sacrifice every year shows that for ancient Israel, Passover was not just a one-time event. It did not just happen once and then pass away. The Passover was to be observed forever until the end of time, end quote. So in this one paragraph, this one little paragraph, all credibility of the author's argument is lost. It's gone. And why is that? <clears throat> because he fails to be faithful to the text in Exodus and inserts his own vocabulary to make his point. A vocabulary, however, that cannot be found in the text. In fact, his entire argument for interpreting the words of Jesus in John 6 literally and for the Catholic teaching of transubstantiation falls apart in this short paragraph here, and specifically with the use of two words. So I'm going to reread uh, this paragraph and see if you can note the two words that totally derail his argument. Now, here's that quote. Here we see that the final step was for the Passover liturgy to be repeated. Every year in the spring, on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, Israel was to celebrate this day of remembrance in honor of the salvation that had been won for them by God through the hands of Moses. This command to renew the sacrifice every year shows that for ancient Israel, Passover was not just a one-time event. It did not just happen once and then pass away. No, the Passover was to be observed forever until the end of time, end quote. So did you catch those two words? I'll give you a hint. They both begin with the letter R. And they are uh, the words repeat and renew. So the Passover, according to Petre, was to be repeated and renewed every year until the end of time. But there are just two main problems with uh, his use of these words. <clears throat> One, these words are not in the text. They're simply not there. They are his own words. <clears throat> and two, and more importantly, the Passover cannot be renewed or repeated. It's impossible. Uh, it can be remembered and it can be celebrated. It can be a Memorial Day, uh, just as the text says, but it cannot be repeated and it can't, cannot be renewed. Uh, that is impossible. And it's strange too. It's almost as if the author just slyly inserts these words and, and hopes the reader doesn't catch what he just did. And he, he himself acknowledges in the same paragraph that the Passover was to be a day of remembrance, just as the text says. And that is all the biblical text allows for, a memorial day of remembrance to remind God's people of what he did for them in delivering their firstborn from death. Certainly, however, uh, that cannot be recreated uh, or renewed. Uh, it cannot be repeated. It happened once. And that one time was sufficient for accomplishing God's purposes for his people. Nowhere do we see the Hebrews uh, repainting their doorways with lamb's blood and the spirit of God passing through once again, sparing the firstborn. That is unnecessary and would delig delegitimize uh, the original Passover. Once was enough. God accomplished his purposes one time because that's all he needed. Uh, certainly the 
the, the Passover can and must be remembered and celebrated and memorialized, but it cannot and must not be repeated or renewed, as the author suggests. And you could even, I guess, attempt in some strange way to recreate the event, but certainly the recreation of the event or, or the attempt thereof is by no means the same as the event itself. In fact, far from it. Uh, so then from here, it should be quite clear where the author goes and the parallel that he attempts to, to draw. Uh, certainly it is correct to, to draw a parallel between the Passover of the Old Testament and that of the New, but what is not correct is the manner in which Dr. Petre does, does so in his, in his book. In making the connection between the Passover of Exodus 12 and that of the New Testament, he makes the same error again as before, an attempt to convince the reader that Jesus' words in John chapter 6 should be taken literally. In fact, on page 72, uh, referencing Matthew 26, chapter 26, verses 27 to 28, uh, which says, quote, And he, Jesus, took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, end quote. Now, this is followed by the author's own words in which he writes, quote, when we compare Jesus's actions to these ancient Jewish traditions, it doesn't take much imagination to figure out his point. By means of his words over the bread and wine of the Last Supper, Jesus is saying in no uncertain terms, I am the new Passover lamb of the new Exodus. This is the Passover, Passover of the Messiah, and I am the sacrifice. I am the new sacrifice. If this interpretation is right, he says, then the implications are enormous. For one thing, it shows that Jesus not only kept the Jewish Passover, he, he also deliberately altered it, thereby instituting a new Passover. A second sign that the Last Supper was a new Passover is Jesus's command for his actions to be repeated. Now here we have that word again, <clears throat> repeated. When he told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me, here citing 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, he was echoing the command of God to keep the ancient Passover as a remembrance forever. Citing again, Exodus 12, 14. By means of these words, he was commanding his disciples to perpetuate this new Passover sacrifice in the future, end quote. So you see, he's once again making the same mistake as before and in, in inserting a word that is simply not in the text. Christ himself said to do this in remembrance of me. Never does Jesus tell his disciples to repeat his sacrifice as the author erroneously states here. It is impossible to repeat what Christ did on the cross, nor does it need to be repeated. It was sufficient. And these aren't my words, it's what the Bible says <laughs> with plain words. In fact, read Hebrews 10, and this becomes crystal clear. <clears throat> and here I'll cite a few verses, but read the entire chapter and even read chapter 9 on your own. It will be, it will be very helpful for this discussion. But here uh, is a reading of Hebrews 10, 4 through 14, which says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, <clears throat> Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me, and burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first order to establish the second. And by that, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his sacrifice at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away the sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified, end quote. So clearly Christ's sacrifice was once and for all. It is not an event to be repeated or represented, nor can it be. Certainly it should be remembered and celebrated just as Christ commands, but it is not to be repeated. 
doing so contradicts the efficacy of Christ's once and for all work on the cross. He is not represented in the Eucharist. His sacrifice is not recreated. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, just as Hebrews 10 clearly states. But do you know how many times Hebrews 10 is mentioned in Dr. Petre's book? Zero times. Zero times. It's never once mentioned. It is avoided entirely. So when Dr. Petre suggests that when Christ commanded his disciples to do this in remembrance of me, he was suggesting his disciples recreate his sacrifice and eat of his actual flesh and drink of his actual blood, he has missed the point entirely. On page 74, the author writes, quote, <clears throat> with all of this in mind, we can now go back to the, our original question about the mystery of the Last Supper. How is it that Jesus, as an observant Jew, could have ever commanded his disciples to eat his body and drink his blood? As we saw earlier in both the Old Testament uh, and ancient Jewish tradition, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb was not completed by its death. It was completed by a meal, by eating the flesh of the lamb that had been slain. Therefore, if Jesus saw himself as the new lamb, then it makes sense that he would speak of his blood being poured out and command his disciples to eat his flesh, end quote. But again, Dr. Petre has missed the point entirely. There was nothing uh, effectual in the actual eating of the lamb's flesh. It wasn't as if that was what made the Passover effective. No, God's action itself of graciously passing over the houses of his people was where the Passover was effect, uh, effectuated. The eating of the, blam, the, the eating of the lamb was symbolic of what God had done for his people, but it certainly did not affect God's work. So when Dr. Petre then draws the parallel that Christ's followers have to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood to effectuate his work on the cross, he's dead wrong. Like Listen to the author's words himself on page 75. Quote, did the actual flesh of the lamb have to be eaten in order for the sacrifice to be complete? Yes. Could a symbol of the lamb's flesh suffice? By now, we know that the answer is negative. In other words, Jesus knew full well what any first century Jew would have known. When it came to the Passover, you did not only have to kill the lamb in order to fulfill God's law. In order to be saved from death, you had to eat the flesh. You had to eat the lamb. As with the old Passover of the first Exodus, so with the new Passover of the Messiah. The main difference between the two is that in the new Passover, the lamb is a person and the blood of redemption is the blood of the Messiah, end quote. So do you see how he continues to perpetuate the same theological error? <clears throat> Did God's people have to eat the flesh of the lamb as part of the sacrifice and to receive forgiveness uh, as part of the covenant, all, the old covenant? Yes, but because God commanded them to do so. But was there any forgiveness effectuated by the actual eating of the lamb? No, absolutely not. Forgiveness came from God and God alone. The eating of the flesh was symbolic of what was being effectuated by God's grace and mercy poured out on his people. So to suggest that Christ's followers have to do the same with his flesh and blood is not only wrong and not biblical, it obscures the full efficacy of Christ's work on the cross for those who place their faith in him. In fact, remember the words of Hebrews 10.10. 10. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, end quote. We are in no way sanctified through the consumption of his actual flesh and actual blood. That must be rejected. It must be rejected because it suggests that there's something that we have to do and can do to effectuate Christ's redeeming work on the cross. That, however, would contradict the claim of the, reform, the reformers that in Christ alone, through faith alone, do we participate in his redemptive work. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Because the offering of Christ's body on the cross was once for all, it cannot and must not be repeated or renewed. It was sufficient and remains sufficient. It must be remembered and celebrated, but it cannot be repeated or represented or renewed, and for it is not at all necessary. Like back in episodes five and six of this podcast, uh, we spoke about the blurring of time distinctions in Roman Catholic theology. 
Uh, and in those episodes, we discussed the terms, if you remember, uh, hapox and malon. So a quick refresher on the meaning of those terms. You know, the gospel is a message that is based on what God has done, which would be hapax, and on what he is doing, which is malon. Now, while, while, at times, uh, while at time the difference uh, between those terms might be subtle, uh, that difference must be maintained in order to remain faithful to God's redemptive actions throughout history. If those terms, which have to do with time distinctions, are blurred, the consequences on the gospel can be enormous, as is oftentimes the case in Roman Catholic theology. Uh, nowhere is that seen more clearly than the Catholic Church's teaching on the Eucharist. And here we have to remember one of the, the main pillars on which the Roman Catholic theological system is built and that we've discussed uh, many times, and that being the Christ-Church interconnection. And the church, if you remember, understands itself to be the continued incarnation of Christ. Christ makes himself present through the church. And as the director of the Reformation Initiative, who you all know very well, Leonardo de Chirico uh, writes in his Vatican files, uh, quote, one of the in in inevitable results of the Roman Catholic understanding of the church as a continuation of the incarnation is the expansion of the categories through which Roman Catholicism understands the work of redemption, in particular, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Because the church is involved in the time of the incarnation of the Son, it is also active in his redemption, uh, which is accomplished on the cross, end quote. So in other words, what he's saying what should be exclusively considered hapax or once and for all, uh, which in this case is the redemptive work of Christ on the cross, has been blurred and has become malon or ongoing. Now, why would this be problematic, you might ask? Isn't it enough to, to believe that Christ died on the cross for our sins? Do we really have to get into the details of hapax and malon? Uh, isn't that a bit too much? And those are fair and good questions, uh, and Leonardo answers them well and clearly in his Vatican Files article, noting that this fluid understanding of time and the blurring uh, of that which is once and for all with that which is ongoing has indeed important theological repercussions, particularly concerning the doctrine of justification. Uh, because of the ongoing work of Christ through the church and through the continual representation of his sacrifice by means of the Eucharist, justification is not a single declarative act. It is not hapax. It's not once and for all, but has now become malon or ongoing. In fact, justification is a gradual and progressive process through which the righteousness of Christ is increasingly infused into the faithful, according to Roman Catholic theology. But that is not what the Bible teaches about justification and, and changes entirely, in fact, the nature of the gospel message. Furthermore, as Leo, Leonardo writes in his article, quote, inseparably connected to these crucial elements of the doctrine of the Eucharist is the centrality and agency of the church. If the Eucharist is the representation of the sacrifice of Christ, sacrifice of Christ, then the subject, in this case the church, that offers the sacrifice assumes a decisive role in the workings of it. That is, it not only receives its benefits, but it also actualizes them and carries out its memorial, end quote. Like this is one of the major dangers of blurring these time distinctions. With the church's teaching that Christ's sacrifice is represented in the Eucharist, it puts itself in the place of actualizing and effectuating Christ's work on the cross. Instead of being the mere benefactor of it, it is actually, it actualizes and affects Christ's work. But the Bible simply does not permit this. Uh, and this is why the time distinctions must be maintained. And that is why Christ's redemptive work on the cross, as Hebrew 10 clearly states, is hapax, or it's once and for all, and it must remain that way. So when Dr. Petre attempts to draw parallels between the Eucharist and ancient Judaism to convince the reader of Christ's real, actual, and physical presence in the Eucharist, he has to blur important time distinctions in order to do so. And he has to try and convince the reader that events that are 
that are and must remain hapax are actually malon. In this case, he attempts to convince the reader that the Passover of the Old Testament is malon, when it clearly is hapax, <laughs> even inserting words such as renew and repeat into text when they are simply not there. And for these reasons, his book uh, and the arguments he makes uh, fail, simply fail to convince. <clears throat> and it also continues uh, to be puzzling how this book, uh, so poorly argued, can be so instrumental in an evangelical family's conversion to Roman Catholicism. But it is obviously confirmation of how important it is for the evangelical church to be equipped to answer tough questions re uh, regarding Roman ca Catholic teaching, uh, such as this. It continues to appeal to many evangelicals, and the church needs to know how to respond. <clears throat> All right, our time is about up. But before we conclude, let's briefly discuss the question one of our listeners uh, raised and that was mentioned at the beginning of this episode. Why would so many Catholics suggest that uh, the one thing that would have to change in Roman Catholicism in order for them to leave the church is the church's teaching on transubstantiation and the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist? Eucharist. Why is that? I think the answer is best stated in the cate uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church that we cited earlier. If you remember, section 1374 uh, says this, quote, the mode of Christ's presence under the Eucharist species, Eucharistic species is unique. It raises the Eucharist above all the sacraments, uh, sacraments as the perfection of the spiritual life and the end to which all the sacraments tend. And the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore the whole Christ is truly, really, and substantially contained, end quote. So you see, the sacrament, this sacrament, represents the perfection of the spiritual life. It is the end to which all the other sacraments tend. By the means of Eucharist, and the real presence of Christ, the Catholic faithful encounter Christ, and they eat his body and drink his blood. That's why it's so important for Roman Catholics. Take this away, and you take away the perfection of the spiritual life, and you take away the sacrament of sacraments. It's the apex of the Catholic experience. But I don't think the Catholic faithful have, any, faithful have anything uh, to worry about. I don't think this teaching is going any way, anywhere, anytime soon. <clears throat> but from an evangelical perspective, uh, this view must be rejected for all the reasons we've spoken about. We cannot allow for a blurring of time distinctions as it has tremendous re repercussions on the gospel and the redemptive work of God in history through the person of Jesus Christ. Now, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, Christ is most certainly present but he is present spiritually by means of the Holy Spirit that he sent on his behalf upon his ascension into heaven, where he is now sitting at the right hand of the Father, ruling the nations. In fact, when we eat the bread and drink the wine or juice, we are reminded of the severity of our sins and what uh, Christ had to endure on the cross in order to forgive us of our sins. And this is exactly what God's people did in the Old Testament to remember the Passover. They ate the flesh of the, uh, of the sin offering, uh, because it reminded them of the weight and cost of their sin, and it reminded them uh, that it required death in order for them to be forgiven of their sins. But eating of the flesh by no means effectuated their forgiveness. That was a work of God <clears throat> and his grace alone. And it is the exact same with Jesus Christ and his redemptive work on the cross. <clears throat> that is the great news of the gospel, and the church must uphold it and defend that truth. Uh, and of course, all uh, for the glory of God. <clears throat> One last note. Uh, in this episode, uh, we have rejected a literal interpretation of Jesus' words to his disciples in John chapter 6, <clears throat> but we have not uh, offered uh, an alternative reading, but that would require an additional episode or episodes for sure. But, but let me say this. If you want a good evangelical interpretation of, of John chapter 6, uh, read D.A. Carson's uh, commentary on the gospel according to John. It's a classic, uh, and, and in his commentary, he provides an excellent study of those verses and convincingly, convincingly advocates for a metaphorical, Christological uh, reading of the bread of life discourse 
that we've mentioned here. And it's really fantastic, so, so check it out. Okay, that's all we have time for today. I hope that was helpful. But as always, please don't hesitate to write and ask questions or make suggestions if this episode raises any questions or concerns or if anything needs to be clarified. We are always happy to hear from our listeners and are always thankful for your contribution and input. Uh, And please be sure to like our podcast if you haven't already and give us a five-star review. It actually really does help. But uh, thank you so much and goodbye for now from Rome. And until next time, God bless.